The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom waves its family-friendly flag proudly, boasting an epic adventure for all ages. Although, upon closer inspection by gamers of a certain age, all is not innocent in the Kingdom of Hyrule. Caution, Tears of the Kingdom spoilers ahead. <laughs> After sitting out Breath of the Wild and several other titles, Ganondorf returned to the Zelda franchise in Tears of the Kingdom. As many fans were quick to notice before the game even released, the Demon King gets a different look this time around. He traded in his more restrained armored attire for lots of bare skin, strategically placed tattoos, and gold accessories. He also clearly hit the gym during his absence. With chiseled muscles on display everywhere players look. When Zelda and Link first encounter Ganondorf during the sequel's opening act, he appears as little more than a well-accessorized hunk of jerky. Of course, he doesn't stay in this guise and later faces Link in his proper rehydrated form. This turn of events puts off some real The Mummy vibes. The first two films in the reboot series feature the cursed Egyptian priest, Imhotep, returning from the dead to take over the world using dark magic. When he first revives, he doesn't look so great. But by the end of the film, he fully regenerates into a complete hottie, sporting flowing robes with his bare chest on display. Imhotep was a confusing crush for the Mummy viewers in the late 90s and early 2000s. Now Ganondorf has turned up to make players question their views on the undead all over again. Modern businesses go to great lengths to collect customer information and make more sales. These tactics take many forms, ranging from opting into text messages or emails in exchange for coupon codes to loyalty programs that allow buyers to earn points and redeem rewards whenever they shop. Simply enter some information and watch your inbox fill up with promotions and your wallet overflow with rewards cards for every store you've ever visited. It seems players can't get away from this seemingly inevitable reality even in Zelda games. As soon as Link registers with a network of stables, the local owner opts him into the Pony Points program. Molly earns free points by simply visiting the different stable locations, he has to register horses or shell out money for beds to continue moving up the tiers and unlock more rewards. The Pony Point setup is nice for those who already plan to go horse hunting or take advantage of the lodging. However, it's also one of a few jarring ways that the real world bleeds into the setting. Nothing helps you forget your everyday troubles quite like carting around a rewards card or stopping to take a bunch of photos with your tablet while exploring ancient ruins. Now, if only Nintendo would add Hyrule's take on Instagram. When the developers at Nintendo set out to create a follow-up to Breath of the Wild, they clearly had a core objective in mind – make players as thirsty as possible. Ganondorf may be the entree, but the studio has served up plenty of appetizers. One step at a time. What exactly happened? Zelda has a new haircut and gown, complemented by tasteful but eye-catching accessories. Link continues to flirt with androgyny, and the team made sure to reduce him to just his undies again for the start of the game. Sidon, already a complete catch, features once more, and is as elegant and supportive as ever. Then there are the research characters, Pora, who accidentally de-aged herself into a child in Breath of the Wild, got a major glow up for Tears of the Kingdom. Rather than a kid, she appears as a young adult for the sequel, complete with fitted clothing and high heels, which, you know, doesn't inspire any weird feelings at all. The entry also introduces Toro, a ripped Hylian researcher who just loves fieldwork. Presumably, he pumps iron while translating Zonai. No wonder so many people have developed a sudden interest in the ancient language. When players finally follow up on the wealth of hints from multiple NPCs and head to Rito Village, they find the settlement in dire straits. A supernatural blizzard has rendered the area nigh unreachable and inhospitable, cutting it off from its usual supply chains and leading to a food shortage. Link strolls in to learn more about the situation, only to discover that nearly all of the adult Rito have flown the nest, leaving their young children to manage the settlement and its businesses. The tiny Rito run everything from the store to the inn without any form of supervision. Tebar and his wife seem to be the only fully grown Rito left and they stand together on one of the higher platforms, presumably basking in the glow of all of that free child labor. Meanwhile, the fledglings scurry around in the lower levels, trying to figure out how to keep the village running while the other adults scavenge for food or search for clues regarding the origin of the blizzard. This situation feels like walking into a mall and finding a bunch of eight-year-olds manning every store, not a security guard or manager in sight. While their parents later commend them for their contributions, it's quite heart-wrenching to see the fledglings carry such a heavy burden without protection, comfort, or guidance. 
As Link moves between the central locations in Hyrule, he collects battle companions from the major tribes. This process involves each combat partner learning a foundational lesson before they can assist the protagonist in solving the region's big problem. For fan favorite Prince Sidon, Nintendo decided to drive home a concept that seems simple enough on the surface. Don't let fear stop you from living your life. Unfortunately, the way the developer decided to handle this issue raises some red flags. As part of his quest, Sidon's newly introduced fiancé confronts him after he spends a significant amount of time holed up in one area of Zora's domain, working to fight off the sludge that has contaminated the local water supply. While her words seem to come from a place of concern, she tells him that he's letting the fear of losing someone important to him stop him from going with Link to investigate the cause of the sludge. Rather than acknowledging the validity of his experience or the toll of everything the prince has been through, like losing his sister and almost losing his father, she insists that the Sidon she knows wouldn't behave that way. In response, he plasters on a smile and agrees to go with Link. This scene echoes a common situation that many people experiencing mental distress encounter. Faced with a change in their demeanor, those close to them may insist that they aren't acting like themselves and suggest that they simply decide to be happy instead. These moments, much like the scene with Sidon, falsely suggest that only some of their feelings are valid, or that people can simply decide to stop feeling a certain way. In the Zora Royals case, the game seems to hint that he only has value when he's chipper and supportive of those around him. But the moments he needs support, he's basically told to get over it and go back to acting normal because it's more convenient for everyone else. More players of all ages can appreciate the opportunity to express their love for a virtual good boy, dog petting, or the lack thereof, has become a hilarious point of contention for more seasoned gamers in recent years. A Twitter account with over 500,000 followers exists solely to document whether players can properly interact with animals in-game, and the question makes rounds on major news sites every time a new title releases. <laughs> Unfortunately for Zelda fans, Tears of the Kingdom does not allow players to pet the dogs they encounter around Hyrule. Like in Breath of the Wild, feeding the dogs can earn Link their canine affection. Properly appreciative pups may even lead the swordsman to hidden treasure. However, this doesn't make up for the fact that he can't interact with them. An especially heartbreaking realization when the dogs in question roll onto their backs and present their bellies for rubs. Sorry pooches, Nintendo just didn't see adding this feature as a priority. Link meets a lot of people on his travels, and that's even if you ignore the series canon, which states that there have been many versions of Link over the millennia. It would make sense for the hero to forget a few of the faces he's encountered while facing down the forces of evil, but it makes a bit less sense for the people he saved to forget him. Still, that seems to be what's happened for many of the NPCs Link encounters in Tears of the Kingdom. Despite the fact that players spent a lot of time helping out the Koroks in the previous game, most of the little guys here don't seem to have any knowledge of Link. You'd think it'd be a legend among Koroks. But even stranger is the fact that many of the citizens of Terrytown don't appear to recognize him. A bit of time has passed since the events of Breath of the Wild, during which Link essentially bought the land and founded the town. There's a whole questline devoted to the creation of this village, but Link is essentially a stranger there now.